So, welcome everybody. I am Tatiana Bazzichelli, the director of the Disruption Network Club. And uh, I'm really happy to introduce to you our 15th conference, Dark Havens Confronting Hidden Money and Power. And first of all, I would like to thank uh, my wonderful team. Uh, first, uh, Lieke Plucher, that uh, from this year is with us, the director of the Activation Community Program. So, <laughs> uh, we have been already doing a great event uh, with her, uh, and there will be another one that will follow up on April uh, 17. And then I want to thank uh, uh, the wonderful team I work with, uh, Daniela Silvestrin, Nada Bakker, and Monty Harmony, uh, the project managers of the Disruption Network Club, and uh, James Franchi, the designer and strategist, and Joe Haveman, the uh, PR manager. So thanks uh, a lot to all of you. And to do a little intro about the Disruption Lab, we are working since uh, 2014 um, to examine the intersection of politics, uh, technology, technology and society, and the arts. And uh, as I say, this is our uh, 15th conference uh, and is also uh, starting uh, the two years collaboration that we have together with Transparency International. And I really uh, want to deeply thank them, uh, especially Michael Hornsby, Max Haywood, and Myra Martini, uh, because uh, this collaboration has been so great for us so far and will be also <laughs> later. And uh, we have been also constructing this program together. There were a lot of sharing, of discussion. So thank you very much, because uh, for the Disruption Lab to have a partnership for you and with you is really wonderful. So thank you, Transparency International. And uh, um, also, I want to thank our funders, the Hauptstadt Kultur Fund, that is the Capital Culture Fund of Berlin the Riva and David Logan Foundation, the Checkpoint Charlie Foundation, um, and also uh, the support of the Open Society Initiative for Europe within the Open Society Foundations. And we are also working in partnership with the Friedrich Eber Stiftung. And our partner venues, uh, the Kunstan Kreuzberg Betanien, the supermarket where we will have our workshop on Sunday, and state studios where we are doing our community program. And uh, thanks also to our collaboration partners, the Alexander von Humboldt Institute for Internet Society and the Whistleblower Network uh, FAO, and our communication partners in Werkstatt and Furterfield. And then, of course, I want to thank all our wonderful speakers that will be with us in the next two days and uh, introduce a bit to this conference. Um, we are following uh, the cases of the Panama Paper, the Bahamas Leaks, and also the Paradise Papers. Um, and uh, uh, by investigating uh, this kind of subjects, uh, at the same time, we want to discuss the inner mechanism of the financial systems. And what we really want to point out also for the history of the Disruption Network Club is that uh, these kind of uh, uh, topics are not just uh, related to uh, financial issues, uh, to really technical subjects, but uh, are also uh, connected with uh, um, other effects uh, on society and politics uh, and the everyday life of everybody because uh, um, as the whistleblower John uh, Doe was saying by speaking about tax havens offshore systems uh, we are also speaking about uh, social inequality um, and this kind of uh, uh, form of um, uh, discrimination that are not only economically uh, driven but also uh, are related to the way uh, the society then is built up uh, and also the way inequality is formed. Uh, so in this two-day conference um, we want to discuss these topics. We have many uh, international and local speakers that are joining us. At the same time today we will show the German premiere of the Panama Papers, uh, the documentary directed by Alex Winter. And uh, on Sunday, we will have a workshop uh, that is a psychogeography tour 
uh, of the Berlin Shell companies uh, organized uh, uh, by the artist uh, collective rybn.org. So uh, now that we gave this introduction, I'm uh, really happy to introduce the first panel. Um, that's the title uh, Hidden Treasures how the global uh, shadow economy drives inequality, so connected to the discourse I was doing before. So I'm happy to call on stage uh, Nicola uh, Shackson, please come, um, and Mayra Martini, and uh, the panel is moderated by Simon Schuster. So I go here on the side. <laughs> Thank you for being uh, with us. And uh, as uh, we usually do, um, I like to introduce the moderator, uh, Simon, and then he will introduce uh, the speakers. Um, Simon Schuster has been in Berlin um, since uh, six years, you told me, uh, more or less, and uh, um, has been the Berlin bureau chief of Time magazine since uh, 2013. Uh, responsible for coverage of Central and Eastern Europe. He is born in Moscow and uh, raised in San Francisco. And he has been working, uh, uh, focusing on the European refugee crisis, the rise of right-wing populism and the Russian hybrid warfare. So thank you very much and uh, we will enjoy the panel together. Thank you. Hi all, thank, thank you all for coming. Hi, thank you so much for that, that uh, in, introduction. Um, uh, so you were introduced our, our guest briefly, but I was given about uh, five minutes or so to kind of in, introduce the topic. Um, and I wanted to start with, with uh, a reporting experience that I had on the subject of tax havens uh, some years ago, it was about 2013. Uh, and, and one of the characters um, that I came across in a story I was working on was a guy named Peter Troost. Uh, he's from the small town of Skokie, Illinois, uh, and his business for about 50 years was selling tombstones. So if you die, you can go see Peter Troost and he'll set you up with a nice stone. Uh, and he made you know, a few million dollars over the years uh, in this business. Um, and because he didn't want to pay taxes, he, he uh, moved that money to a Swiss bank um, to hide it. Uh, in 2013, he is informed by the uh, American justice system that uh, he is being charged with tax evasion, a uh, very serious crime in the US and many places. Um, and his uh, prosecution was presented by the American government uh, and the Department of Justice as, as kind of a success story as part of a much bigger crackdown on uh, tax havens uh, and tax avoidance. Um, uh, the Obama administration was kind of made this a, a pillar of their uh, uh, time in office. Um, Obama famously, you know, touted this as a, as a main issue uh, in 2008 when he was on the campaign trail. He pointed out um, uh, uh, the Oogland House in, where was it, in the Caribbean or where is it? Cayman Islands. <clears throat> and he said, you know, th there's 12,000 companies registered in this one house in the Cayman Islands. Uh, and he said that's either the biggest tax scam or the biggest house in the world. Uh, and indeed, when he, when he came to power, um, there were some, some serious reforms. Uh, we got the, uh, the, what is it, Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act, otherwise known as NAMBLA or FAT, FATCA, FATCA, uh, which is a serious piece of uh, legislation. And I was reporting a lot on, on how the United States government under Obama was going after uh, Swiss banks. Uh, in particularly um, for, for bank secrecy. Um, and I, I happened to be um, at the headquarters of the uh, Swiss Bankers Association when the Swiss government finally capitulated to American pressure uh, and said, fine, we will open our secrecy up after decades uh, and give you information about uh, the clients of Swiss banks. Um, and, and these guys in this, the, the Bankers Association that day were uh, really in a panic running around like their hair was on fire, and uh, I, I talked to one executive there, uh, and he said, you know, if you've heard the news, that means the world has changed. Uh, you know, great quote, wrote it down in my notebook. Um, but as, as the months went on, it was clear that the world 
hadn't really changed all that much. Um, I, I then talked to a Caribbean banker, uh, sorry, a Caribbean lawyer uh, who works on tax issues, and I asked him, you know, is, is it true? Has the world changed with, with FATCA, with, with a lot of the initiatives that the U.S. has uh, implemented? Uh, and he said, not really. Well, the difference is that um, guys like Peter Troost, who's like, you know, a, a millionaire, but maybe has a couple million dollars, he uh, is now screwed because this very simple mechanisms for tax avoidance that he uses don't work anymore. But for the Caribbean lawyer, his prices and his clients uh, are just fine because for the more complex uh, methods of tax avoidance that I think we're going to talk about uh, a bit on this panel as well, uh, those continue to, to, to survive and, and indeed thrive in the years since then. So I, I think more pressure came from things like the Panama Papers and, and uh, the work that you guys do. Um, uh, rather than relying on governments to sort of police these ultra, ultra rich people. Uh, so uh, with that, I want to turn it over to some, some specific cases that uh, my colleagues here are going to talk about. Um, Nicholas, I think you wanted to go first. So, so Nicholas, you were introduced. Um, he's, he's written a couple books on the subject, most recently uh, The Finance Curse, which came out last year in the UK. Um, and I'll turn it over to you to uh, get us into the nitty gritty of things. Thanks. Should he use this microphone, or it doesn't matter? Yes, good. This one. Okay. Great, thanks for that introduction. So I'm going to start actually with a very broad overview. Um, that's going to be my presentation today. I'm going to look at um, tax havens, the subject of my book, Treasure Islands, but also try and marry it with the ideas of um, my latest book, The Finance Curse, which is very complementary and use this as a pointer towards how we can think about finding solutions for these gigantic problems that we're all gra grappling with here. Um, a little bit of background, I am a journalist by background. I started in Angola um, back in the 90s um, during the war, trying to understand why such an oil-rich country was so poor. Um, the war was one reason, but uh, there were lots of other reasons. Um, and just then, academics were putting together this concept called the resource curse, and we'll, we'll get into that, but um, I kind of stumbled, I kept bumping up against, against tax havens when I was in Angola, it was kind of the end of my investigations. Um, and later, um, in the early 2000s or the mid 2000s, I started looking at tax havens, and I realized, I had thought that my career was going to be looking at oil and politics in West Africa. There was quite enough there to be um, looking at. But when I met John Christensen, who had set up, who was the main founder of the Tax Justice Network, he laid out the issue of global tax havens, which then everybody saw as a kind of exotic sideshow to the global economy. Um, and I realized how huge this issue was and how interesting it was. I basically, from one day to the next, I flipped my career. I realized this was, I couldn't leave this alone. I had to start looking at this. Um, so, and, and that led to my book, Treasure Islands. So I'm, I, I am going to, as I said, talk very kind of broadly today um, as a sort of introduction to this, um, this event. And I'm just going to start by some very simple ideas, my own thoughts, um, the results of my thoughts of having worked on tax havens. What is a tax haven? There is no generally agreed definition of tax havens. There's a few technical definitions out there that focus on tax. But my definition, which I, I hope is one of the shortest definitions in the world, really boils down to two words. Um, and those words are escape and elsewhere. In other words, you take your money somewhere else to escape whatever rules you don't like. Tax rules, financial regulation, whatever. So I take a very broad view of what offshore is. This broad view, um, once you start looking at the jurisdictions that are involved, you realize that what they're offering, offering tax is usually only one component of a whole range of facilities that they're offering. They're offering secrecy facilities. They are offering um, escape from certain laws that, um, and it's nearly always either wealthy individuals, super wealthy individuals in, particularly, in particular, and multinational enterprises that are the main users of tax havens. So they're able to get um, <coughs> excuse me, escape routes and impunity from democratic laws. Criminals, of course, I think um, that's the kind of has been until recently the popular perception of crime, of tax havens, it's all about crime. 
Um, monopolies is another interesting one. Market power, tax havens, and, and we can discuss this in the questions if anybody's interested, are tremendous vehicles for increasing the power of already large and powerful corporations or, um, uh, or even individuals. They're super, they're, they're great mechanisms for controlling markets. This is all about rigging markets. It's about rigging the economic system, rigging the cap capitalist system against ordinary people in favor of a, a small number of people. So the theme of this um, talk um, focuses quite heavily on inequality. And all of the mechanisms I'm gonna talk about really have an impact on inequality, political inequalities, economic inequalities, inequalities between countries, inequalities within countries, um, gender inequality, racial inequalities, all of these things are made worse by this phenomenon of offshore tax havens. The other thing that some people are confused about, not everything that happens in tax haven, a tax haven is illegal of course, but a lot of stuff that gets called legal activity, that gets called tax avoidance, and if you look in the dictionary, the English dictionaries will say tax avoidance is legal by definition. Well, in fact, we, again, we can discuss this in the questions. A lot of what gets called tax avoidance, corporate tax avoidance, is not legal. So I, I'm a journalist, but I'm also a campaigner and activist. I believe I, my book, Treasure Islands, is a book with very strong opinions. I believe this stuff is, and I, I guess most people in this room would agree with me, this stuff is very, very bad for our societies, our economies. Um, I like to steer clear of technical legal de definitions about what's legal and what's not. If you start getting into that terrain, you get bogged down very quickly and lose your way. I like to focus on the political effects of this and the economic effects of this. This is transferring, engineering a gigantic transfer of wealth upwards from poorer sections of society, wealth and power from poorer sections of society up to richer sections. Another great theme that I have found in, in all tax havens, and particularly the smaller havens in this case, um, is what I call the captured state, where the offshore financial sector comes to dominate not only the entire political system, but it t dominates, and the economic system as well, it tends to dominate the culture as well. So you get, it's very, very difficult and painful for people in these places, particularly the small places, to oppose the system. Um, I spoke to someone in Liechtenstein who had made some complaints about the offshore system there, and she said that her sister now crossed the street rather than walk past her because she had gone so far beyond the pale. She had questioned the cultural values of these places. Um, and they all have this kind of um, self-belief, we are clean, we are well-regulated, we are responsible, we are international financial centers, we're not tax havens. You'll hear this from all of them. Um, and uh, so this is what I call, you know, it's, it, it's a version of the captured state, but the capture in these, very, in these small havens is, is really absolute and really strong. So tax havens also are suffused with these offshore ideologies where the offshore interest, the interest of the offshore financial sector is equated with the national interest. So what supports fi finance must be good for the country. It turns out that in, if you go to the Cayman Islands, for example, trillions, wheeling uh, trillions of dollars wheeling in and through the Cayman Islands, um, the beneficiaries of that are largely white, male, probably middle-aged and older expatriate players who are temporary residents there. There are some benefits that flow to the local population, but the actual benefits that flow to the populations, even of these very small places where you can have huge amounts of money coming in and potentially being spread among a very small population, even in these places, the actual benefits are pretty limited. And I will argue later that in other countries, uh, particularly larger countries that have a very strong financial model like the UK, this sector has been very, very harmful to the country as a whole. You see all this money coming in, but it actually isn't helping the country, and in fact, it's worse than that. It's damaging the country. Um, so this is another great theme of tax havens, the theme of freedom. These are places that are offering escape... <coughs> Excuse me. 
These are places that are offering escape routes from rules and laws, things that rich people and multi multinationals and criminals and all sorts of different people, what they don't like, they want to escape. Freedom is what they want. Um, and freedom is often taken to be a good thing. But of course, if you start thinking about freedom, you want to ask who is calling for this freedom and what's their interest. So I put a kind of um, slightly frivolous cartoon up here. This is the freedom of the tax haven. It's the freedom of the fox outside the hen house saying freedom for the chickens. Um, you always want to be careful when people start wielding this argument. So there's a great libertarian streak to the, the tax havens, um, which is a cover for something much nastier. Now, here's, there's also a paradox at the heart of tax havens. When I wrote Treasure Islands, and particularly the Swiss chapter, I was always interested, in, it was always the first question I would ask people, how do you square the fact that Switzerland and Swiss people are widely regarded as among the world's most trustworthy, most punctual, most honest, you know, cleanest streets, you know, all these fantastic, wonderful things. And at the same time, Switzerland is arguably the biggest or one of the biggest dirty money laundering centers historically. Well, there's no coincidence actually that you have this clean and dirty going on because you have a tax haven wants to be seen as clean. It wants to be seen as trustworthy because it wants to attract your money. They don't want you. Nobody's going to send their money to a banana republic. Nobody's going to send, you know, you can think about it this way. How many Swiss people will have their money in Nigeria and how many Nigerians are going to have their money in Switzerland? This is a one way flow out of poor countries, unstable countries into rich countries. So. The cleanliness, the trustworthiness is very important. Britain is another example of this. On the other hand, these places want as much dirty money as they can because it's profitable. So you have the incentives to be clean and the incentives to go for the, the dirty stuff. How do you square that circle? Well, there's a, num a number of ways, but for me, the sort of central offering of these offshore tax havens is you can trust us not to steal your money but we will turn a blind eye if you want to steal someone else's. We'll take your dirty money. And it has been a very successful strategy for many of these people operating these tax havens. And there are other mechanisms they use to square that circle and, and of course, spin and we are not a tax haven, we are clean, we are well regulated is the other standard thing that we see again and again and again. So this is just my kind of conceptual beginning for how to think about what tax havens are. They're escape routes. Um, and they're, they're, there's kind of, you know, a geography going on. Um, in Treasure Islands, I kind of describe five main groupings. There is, in my view, the biggest or one of the biggest is the British network. And that constitutes of London itself, the city of London itself and the United Kingdom and Scotland as well. I think some of the people in this room will have investigated Scottish um, the structures that have been used to commit some awful crimes. But also the British satellites, the overseas territories and crown dependencies in particular, Jersey, Guernsey, the Isle of Man, the Cayman Islands, Bermuda, Gibraltar, um, all of these places are like satellites of the city of London. And they're used to, uh, how am I doing for time, by the way? How much time have I got left? Okay. Am I okay? Oh, okay. Um, I've got plenty to go. So um, there's a European, there's a kind of group of European tax havens. Luxembourg is a huge one. Switzerland, of course, sort of somewhat outside, somewhat in Europe. Um, Netherlands, Ireland. United States um, is a gigantic tax haven. So the FATCA program that you were talking about was all about Americans finding out about American taxpayers cheating Americans. Sorry? Oh, sorry. Um, so it, it's kind of the, the fact the, the American um, cleanup crackdown with FATCA is kind of like a one-way flow. America finding out information. But if somebody else wants to put their money in the United States and hide from their tax authorities, that's a completely different ma matter. America is not going to be sharing that information in general terms 
with that country, particularly if it's a, if it's a poorer country. And that has been a deliberate strategy. Um, there's some very interesting documents that I found that, that are in Treasure Islands. Um, since, uh, really since the era of the Vietnam War, they really started thinking about this, saying we want to be the new Switzerland. Um, there's a fast-growing Asian network, and there's a few kind of oddballs like Bahamas, Panama, Dubai, which aren't particularly collect connected to any of these powerful countries. And they tend to be kind of down market places because they don't have this sort of bedrock of being either a rich country or supported by a rich country. So they, they don't have that same element of sort of trustworthiness. So they have to go for a different market and that's kind of, you know, shadier stuff. How big is the system? There's a lot of stuff being been written about this. There are two main estimates out there. One is from Gabriel Zuckman, um, uh, a French economist based in the US, I think, um, seven and a half trillion. There's James Henry, who did an estimate for the Tax Justice Network and updated it since they're closer to 40 trillion. Um, I think Henry's is the better estimate, and we can discuss that in the questions if anybody wants to know more about that. Um, another way of looking at it is how much tax is being lost worldwide as a result of corporate tax avoidance. And sorry, I didn't put that in. This is corporate tax avoidance. Um, uh, 600 billion a year. That's just corporations using um, tax havens to avoid tax. Um, okay, I think time is probably running a bit short, but very quickly, this is an ecosystem, different places offering different facilities. So the, so the Netherlands, for example, is all about corporate tax avoidance. Um, Ireland is about corporate tax avoidance plus dodgy financial regulation. Switzerland has an even broader offering. Um, London, even broader, kind of all singing, all dancing haven that offers any kind of offshore service you want, whether in London or in one of its satellites, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, this slide, I think, I will skip over. I think most people in this room are familiar with some of the some of the features of tax havens. There are many different mechanisms. Um, this one is perhaps a little bit more unexpected. I take the view that. And in both Treasure Islands and the Finance Curse, I looked at this in some depth. Offshore, being about escape, one of the biggest elements of this whole system is, involves financial stability, involves um, offering facilities to escape financial regulation. Wall Street London have had this kind of dance where Wall Street wanted to get out of very onerous financial regulations that were underpinning some very high economic growth at the time, until about the 70s, and they used London as their escape route. They were able, it's a kind of like offshore playground for financial regulation. And in the finance curse, I kind of trace how that, how London played not a tangential role, but an absolutely central role in the, creating the global financial crisis. Most people see it as an American phenomenon that kind of spilled out around the world, but this actually was a very different thing. Um, London was absolutely central as an offshore playground degrading American regul regulations and offering this escape route at the same time. Um, and I also argue that London, this financial regulatory escape route was the flip side of London's role as arguably the, the world's foremost dirty money hub. Um, it's the same mentality, the same people, um, the same kind of competitiveness or ideology. We must be competitive. We must attract this hot money by degrading our regulations. It's part of the whole British philosophy. Um, I'm going to skip over this. Um, anybody can have a copy of this presentation later if they want. Um, but at the end of the day, all of these things, all of these different dimensions of offshore, the crime, the financial regulation, the tax, the secrecy, all of these things generate inequality, political inequality and economic inequality. And all of these things, by their very nature, undermine democracy. They escape routes, these are escape routes from the rules of society, from democracy. And they are creating one set of rules for the winners, large multinationals, banks, hedge funds, um, uh, wealthy individuals, and another set of the rules, another set of rules for the rest of us. And that is, about as damaging to democracy as you can get. And it is a systemic global phenomenon. So with that background on tax havens, I now want to bring the finance curse um, concept in here. I think that we need to 
consider new ways of fighting this phenomenon. I think most people in this room probably have some interest in or involvement with trying to fight against all this terrible stuff that we're seeing spewing out of tax havens or spewing into tax havens. Um, I think we need to start by thinking about what power is, why it is so difficult to shut these places down, why are they so difficult to tackle. Well, I like this quote from Lee Shepard, who's a, one of the US top tax experts, um, and she had an article, why don't, we touch, why don't we shut down these financial whorehouses, as she called them. We don't shut them down because the town fathers are in there with their pants around their ankles. In other words, the people who are making our policies, who are in charge, who are running our countries, are the ones who are using this system. And that's just as true of rich countries as it is of poor countries. Um, it's more the case in Britain, where these phenomena are central to the whole elite establishment than it is in Germany. But Angola, they're all using tax havens as well. So it's very difficult to design strategies to tackle this stuff. Another way of thinking about this, <coughs> excuse me. So going back to your example of the US Department of Justice going, going after the, um, in the Obama administration, going after um, Swiss banking crimes. Well, I do not, the Swiss media generally portray this as a battle of America versus Switzerland, a battle of big versus big bully versus small, plucky, brave Switzerland. And it was a very successful way of getting the Swiss to stand together. The Department of Justice knew this, and they took a different approach. They went for the bankers, because a much better way to understand this phenomenon is not country versus tax haven, not America versus Switzerland. This is a global battle of a billionaire, criminalized billionaire class against democracy, against ordinary people. So you need to conceptualize the geography of offshore correctly. This is not country versus country. You need to think this much more in political and economic terms on a global level to understand what's going on. So if we're thinking about Africa, this is not Africa versus the West, um, so much as transnational networks of plunder that include African dictators, but also accounting firms, banks, private equity firms, using techniques to suck money out of Africa, versus broad off African populations. These are the same, this is the same battlefield that we ordinary people are fighting on as well. We have a shared agenda with African populations. So if we want to start thinking about how to tackle the looting of Africa, one of the best ways is to realize that this is not a question of altruism. We, um, we in the West need to sort of, um, you know, give money to Africa, help Africa, because it's very difficult to generate coalitions for this kind of change. You get some NGOs interested, but you won't get people out in the streets with placards in large numbers in their millions protesting about this stuff. But if you can show that we have the same agenda, we have a shared agenda against these transnational networks of plunder that are harming all of us, then you can really start. Once you can persuade people that this stuff is harming our own countries, that people in the powerful countries in the West, that this stuff is harming us, then I think you can start really thinking about proper change. So this is where my concept of the finance curse comes in. Money is flowing out of Africa, being looted and flowing out of Africa. That's obviously harming populations in Africa and in many other countries. But the problem with tackling is that people in the West see this money coming in. In the UK, we see this money coming in, plenty coming into Germany as well. Um, and it's kind of like, well, we don't like what's happening in Africa, but you know, we like the money, it's good for us. So let's, you know, it's a difficult message, very difficult message to sell. And for me, this is the big confusion because if we can show, and we can show, that these inflows are harming our own economies, it's not just Africa being harmed by the outflows, we in the West are being harmed by the in inflows, then I think we really have the potential for a proper, solid, big political platform for change that can really make a difference. I'm afraid, given the time constraints, that I won't have time to go into how this all works, the finance curse, um, 
I've got one more minute. Um, but basically, okay, I will just sum it up in, an, in a nutshell. The finance curse is a phenomenon um, which is now being studied by economists. It is like the resource curse in Africa, all this money pouring into countries like Angola seems not only not to have made Angolans richer, it seems to have made them even poorer. Um, and there's a lot of academic research on this. It is also the case that there's a new load of research from the IMF, the Bank for International Settlements and others, showing that countries that have too much finance, where their financial sectors are too big, too bloated, start to suffer lower economic growth than countries that have a financial sector that's more suited to the demands of its, to the needs of its real economy. And this graph I've got here is kind of like, it's a graph of financial development um, versus grow, economic growth. We all need finance to start off with. We all need it to, you know, pay our bills and stuff. But once your financial sector reaches an optimal size, it shouldn't grow any further. Once it grows bigger than that, then growth starts to suffer. And a whole range of other damages, ranges of um, dimensions of damage hit your country. And this is an exciting new area of research. Once we understand that this, this stuff is bad for us, um, here's another dimension of, 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 of damage. Donald Trump, he's very much a creature of capital flight after his um, big bankruptcies. He kind of recovered particularly through getting capital flight out of all sorts of countries, Russia and elsewhere. Um, the Elf Affair is another fascinating one. I guess some of you in this room will be familiar with the Elf Affair, the wholesale corruption of the entire French political establishment um, through this kind of offshore um, networks linked to African oil. The endless corrosion of British politics, which if you read Private Eye magazine, you will, <coughs> you will be very familiar with, by offshore interests. All of this stuff, that's just another dimension of the damage um, that is coming from all this, all this finance. So um, I, for me, that is the way forward, is to show people in the West that this stuff is bad for us too. Um, this m dirty money coming in from elsewhere, it's not only harming the countries it's being stolen from, it's hurt hurting our own economies too in so many different ways. And, um, I can only you know, do a bit of self-promotion here, read the finance curse to find out more about this. But I, think, I, I do think this is, this is you know, a, a, a very important way of thinking about how to tackle this stuff. Okay, thank you very much. And with that, no, no further introductions needed really, but uh, uh, Mayra Martini is, is with Transparency International, as she was introduced before, and uh, particularly an expert in how banks are used in corruption schemes, and I think that's uh, some of what she's going to talk about. So, Mayra, over to you. Yes. Can I use this microphone? Yes. Is it on? Yeah, you can hear me. Hi, everyone. I don't think. This is dangerous. Yeah. One second. I guess I don't need my pen. That's fine. <laughs> so hi everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here today. Uh, I want to talk to you a bit about the role of banks in in corruption case. I can. I can. Perhaps do this, yeah. <laughs> and um, hopefully I'll pick on some of the things that Nicholas just mentioned. Um, but first, let me introduce to you quickly to, to Transparency International, that's, that's where I work. So we are a global movement and we are present in more than, than 100 countries. You can see there in blue where, where we are. Uh, and we fight corruption. In, in the times we are living now, and I'm from Brazil, so I speak from, from experience, I think it's always useful to remind ourselves that fighting corruption is not an end in itself. So actually what we're fighting for is for a more equal and just society. So just to keep that in mind, once our, our um, uh, uh, anti-corruption becomes also the, popul the, the populist and the, the right-wing uh, way of, of campaigning. So, um, 
um, our, um, our chapters work a lot at the national level. So they have, have quite great achievements in the last 25 years in fighting corruption at, at the national level. But it didn't take so long for us to realize that if we really wanted to make a difference, we would need to look beyond one, one's borders. Corruption is transnational and, and, and need a broader approach uh, if we really want to deal with it. Um, so Nic Nicholas was talking a bit about the role of tax havens and so on. And, and, and corruption is exactly like this. The corrupt needs a place to hide illicit assets and illicit gains. No one wants to steal money and keep it under the mattress at home, right? You need to be able to take it somewhere where you can spend. Um, and that's where secrecy jurisdictions or tax havens, how you want to call it, become very, very attractive. And we have seen that one way of doing it, um, and it's, there have been quite a lot of studies that show that majority of grand corruption cases actually rely on the secrecy and anonymity. So what they need is a company where they don't need to register their name and they can use this company then to do to business in many places. And the problem is that it's very easy to get a company without having to register your own name. It's what we call shell companies if they don't have any other purpose. And there are many secrecy jurisdictions that offer this uh, very easily. So there is a st study that was published last week by a partner organization in the US, the Global Financial Integrity, and they actually showed there has been a saying going around for really long that it's easier in the US to, get a, to open a company than get a library card. So they just went and tested that. And they analyzed all this in all states in the US and they actually showed that. So the, all the green there is what you need to, to get a library card. So you need to give your name, you need to prove your identity. And in red is what you need to, or what you don't need to open a, a company in the US. So that's why, for a while now, Center in our work of Transparency International has been calling for more uh, transparency in corporate um, in, in corporations. What we call beneficial ownership transparency is a very boring and, and term, but it only means to really know who are the real people behind behind companies. But what we also have realized when we Panama Papers showed this and many other scandals showed this is that it's not sufficient to have just a company, right? You need to have a bank account connected to it. If you don't have a bank account, it becomes very difficult to, to actually move money and spend your money. And it's true the banks are seen as gatekeepers, particularly in, in developed countries, they're really seen as gatekeepers in the, of the financial sector, and because of this, they have obligations. And according to international money laundering standards, they have many things that they have to do. I listed here like the three main things uh, I think banks need to do on a daily engagement with customers. The first of it being they need to understand the ownership structure of their corporate clients, including identifying the real people behind those. They have to have adequate mechanisms to deal with high-risk customers. And here I mentioned politically exposed persons that are those who have high-level positions in, in their countries. And they need to submit suspicious activities reports to authorities, that is, communicating authorities that might be something wrong with that transaction so authorities can do something uh, and continue investigating. Um, Danske Bank, Deutsche Bank are just two examples that have been in the media now that show that actually banks are not doing the three things that they, they should be doing. And today, I'm, we are at TI now, we are conducting a study that looks at 50 cross-border corruption cases and trying to understand better how banks are being used and if and how, why they have been failing to, to do their jobs, right? Um, the study is not finalized. Probably you can hear more and see it uh, in, in September when we launch. But today I wanted to bring one case of, that we are analyzing as part of this, this, this larger study that I think it helps to illustrate a bit what is happening uh, and how banks have been, has been used. So it looks complicated, it's not complicated, it's actually a very simple money laundering scheme. With, and um, there are two uh, main banks that are inv were involved in the scheme. They were both in Switzerland, and I promise that this was not agreed, that we were all gonna pick in, on Switzerland, it's just a coincidence. Um, 
So um, this larger scheme, this is just a, a, a small part of a larger scheme that took place in Brazil called Car Wash Lava Jato, many of you might know. And the, the, the broader scheme in Brazil essentially worked like this. You had uh, politicians that would nominate or indicate people to for high-level positions, Petrobras. Petrobras is a Brazilian state-owned company in the oil sector. These people would negotiate public contracts with uh, construction companies. They would get bribes in exchange for that. They would par par uh, part of the bribe would also go to the politicians that nominate them in, in the first place. So that was the essence of the, of the scheme and they have done this in all different sectors where Petrobras operate. So this, this story I would tell, and bear with me, I know there will be a lot of names. Uh, it's just one, one of little small part of, of this scheme. So it all started with um, Petrobras in 2009. The company, one of the managers of the company, this Pedro Bastos, was approached by a company in Benin um, this company in Benin got a concession for exploiting oil in, in Benin and approached Petrobras, offering Petrobras 50, to buy 50% of, of these shares. Internally, there was a discussion. They decided it was not a good deal. Apparently, the manager didn't accept uh, a no as an answer. He continued negotiating with this, with this company in Benin. In 2011, the deal uh, came true and Petrobras bought part of 50% of this oil rights. Um, it turned out that Petrobras sold, paid this company in Benin 34.5 million, you can see there in, in, in the beginning of, of the infograph, and uh, in, immediately in the same day, this company in Benin sent this, the money to another company called Lusitania Petroleum, that is actually the mother company, the, the Benin company is just a subsidiary, and this uh, Lusitania Petroleum is a BVI company, an offshore, never had anything to do with oil in its history, didn't have any assets. So it's a bit of a mystery how it, this company got the, the concession in the first place. So if any journalists in the room want to look into that, that's probably something fishy. Um, so Lusitania Petroleum uh, was owned just by a Portuguese businessman. The, the, the next day, Lusitania Petroleum sends part of this money, so there were three different installments, were sent to another offshore company. They all had accounts with BSIs in, in, in Switzerland, called Acona. Acona was a, a, a comp let, I will stop here and talk a bit about how this company was formed. So Acona is a, formed in the Seychelles, Upon the request of this guy that you can see up there next to BSI's name, David, who was a v vice president for Latin America of BSI, he requested Mossack Fonseca, the one of Panama Papers, to open this Acona in the Seychelles. After this, he opened an account with BSI and this, this company received part of the money, right? Um, the beneficial owner of the company was just some random person, an intermediary, no one knew what, what this person had to do with this. So um, here we can see, uh, this is the request from, from David to open a, an account, uh, an, a company named Acona. Those are all the other companies that he asked Mossack Fonseca also to open. So for other journal for journalists in the room, one more tip. Um, Probably something wrong there. Uh, so f the first, the fir like Lusitania then first transferred 10 million to, to Acon and then their subsequent uh, transfer in the following years. The bank did find something was wrong and asked the, the first 10 million and asked um, the manager of the account, David, for, for more information. And here you can see that his explanation was, and I will quote him, External consultant for Petrobras for international service slash questions, intermediary between Petrobras and Lusitania Petroleum. So you have 10, 000, 10, uh, 10 million being transferred, that is like one third of the whole amount paid by Petrobras for intermediary service, but this apparently was sufficient and the transaction could move on. Now, there was a second transa transaction that 
also raised suspicions. You can see there, the compliance system of the bank said, well, there is a risk of money laundering there. Still, he says, see the proven email attached, blah, blah. And if you go to the, the email that was attached, and finally, I don't have it here. He says, I had conversation, phone conversations with the parties, all fine, period. Move on, you can continue. Um, so that's, that's how you had, in the end, more than half of the total amount that was paid by Petrobras end up in an offshore account owned by a random guy that no one knows who he is. And this Akona was kind of center because from Akona, the money continued moving in, in, in different direct, directions. And I'll talk a bit about the next account that, that got money also with BSI, that is the Sandfield. Same process, Sandfield was created just one month before Petrobras signed the, the agreement with, in Benin, also by the manager of, of BSI who requested that now a company is open in Panama. So he, Mossack Fonseca was the one who opened the, 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 the company and he uh, registered the company and opened an account with, with BSI. And surprise, surprise, the beneficial owner of the account is Pedro Bastos, the same Pedro Bastos who negotiated on behalf of Petrobras the, the purchase of the oil field. So it's not a very difficult thing to do, right? The money left Petrobras, passed through two offshore companies and reached the third one that actually the beneficiary is a manager of Petrobras. So I would say something is, is weird, but the bank apparently didn't think it's weird. And actually he gave as uh, there was in the files of the account, there was a visit card, his Petrobras visit card. So it was filed there. So they knew pretty well who he was. Um, and, and from between 2011 and 2013, Pedro was using this account for many things. He was receiving money, he was buying jewelries everywhere. And funny enough, there is actually a, a payment to a customs office in the airport of the airport of Rio de Janeiro, where probably he just wanted to be able to come in with all the goods that he purchased somewhere else without having to uh, answer any questions. Um, so now let's very quickly, I will move just to the, to the other part of the scheme that involves a politician in Brazil. And he was the one who actually appointed Pedro for, for his position. This time is another Swiss bank that was involved, is uh, Julius Baer, used to be Marin Lynch in, in Switzerland. And the money also started to be moved from this Icona account. You have 1.5 million that goes to uh, trust, from Scotland, as you mentioned, uh, called Orion with uh, Julius Baer. And uh, this trust existed already for a while before this transaction happened. So the, you, you can see this is uh, uh, the account of the trust and you can see that there was money flowing already in 2008. So before this scheme happened, um, and this, the beneficiary of this trust is called Eduardo Cunha. He at the time was the Speaker of the House of, in, the, in, in the Brazilian Congress, pride, a quite uh, important politician. He kind of was the one behind uh, the former President's Dilma impeachment and, and, and let it through. Um, so he was the benefi beneficiary of the account. In, he's in jail now in Brazil and being prosecuted in six different scandals which might explain a bit of the transactions prior to 2011. And I think what is also interesting to see here you can see, for example, there is 264,000 that goes to Posada e Vecino Consultores. This is just a, a corporate service provider from Uruguay who was helping him to set up different trusts and different, open different bank accounts with, uh, with this bank in Switzerland. And they received quite a lot of money. Look, they appeared there three times, 250, 260,000. Um, dollars. And the money stayed in this account. When the money arrived from, from Econa in this account, it stayed there for like three, three years. Only in 2014, when the first director of Petrobras was arrested as part of the, the, the car wash investigations, he moved the money to, to another account. And that is this Triumph account that is a, a an offshore company that was established, uh, created in, in Singapore. 
and he's also the beneficiary. He was a bit smarter, so he created, he had a, a trust, then he had another trust, and he had an uh, offshore, uh, offshore company in Singapore, and the money was moving from in, 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 in these this accounts. Finally, the and he was the beneficiary of all these accounts. There are bank documents that show that his name is there. They, they actually did their jobs. They found out he's a PEP, so they say yes. It comes from a high-risk country, yes. They tick the box, but no problem. That's perfectly fine. He can move all this money. And by the way, in 2014, where all these transactions were taking place, his tax declaration to Brazilian authority it was saying that his income was $100,000 per, per, per year. So yeah, there is something wrong. Um, and then finally, let me show just this. Um, you can see that most of the money end up in this account that calls COPEC. That was also an offshore uh, company. And the beneficial owner of this account is Claudia Cruz, who is Cunha's wife. And uh, this account, there are documents in the bank that show, actually saying that this account is connected to a trust and it's basically just to pay credit card bills. And, and they, they say here it's bad to read, but they're saying that no one should worry that Eduardo Cunha, her husband, has gone very thorough, uh, has gone through thorough due diligence twice. So everything is good, you can continue. And this account was then used to purchase several things. They were going on real shopping sprees to like Miami, New York, Paris, and Rome, and uh, visiting all the, the very expensive places. Uh, it's in Portuguese, but you can see the names of the brands and the amounts they were spending in, in, in different places uh, between 2014 and 2015, 2013 and 2015. Um, there is one, I think, when they went in, in, in the beginning of 2013, they spent nine days in, in Miami and they were staying in a hotel and for nine, nine nights in this hotel they spent $25,000, which is four times uh, queen of salary, was four times queen of salary as a congressman in Brazil. And during these nine days their credit card bill was close to $50,000. So, I think this, this shows a bit that the banks did part of their jobs. They actually identified all the beneficial owners behind uh, those companies and they actually knew quite well uh, why the transactions were happening, but they failed to report. And you, you actually you saw that the compliance system often found also that something is wrong with this, with these transactions, but were just told by the management to proceed regardless. And I think it shows a bit to us that something is wrong, right? Uh, there needs to be better supervision in place. That it, it, it cannot be that a, the bank can run a, an, an account such like this one between 2008 and 2016 without raising any, any questions. Um, and you mentioned a bit that we have been relying on the work of whistleblowers, journalists and civil society organizations to bring uh, this case to light and I think it's time that uh, authorities take this back to themselves and also do their jobs. We can't continue relying only on, on others to do their jobs for them. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, Lots of fascinating detail in there, and uh, I, I know from experience that it's 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 often hard to present the complexity of uh, tax schemes like this um, to readers, to listeners, to my editors, because uh, the complexity is the point, right? In in a lot of ways, I mean, the, these these schemes are designed to be so complex that uh, you know journalists and um, bankers, investigators just get tired of trying to sift through to the, to the beneficial owner, to the person who is behind the schemes, who actually owns the money. So you did a very good job of uh, cutting through the complexity. Um, so we have uh, about 10 minutes of, uh, of, of discussion here, and then I'll, I'll turn it over. I, I don't wanna, um, I wanna, I wanna get to your questions as, as soon as possible. Um, so just, just a, a kind of broad one for both of you guys, uh, for me, 
what do you see as, as the, the weak spot in this system, you know, in, in the, the, the tax haven uh, uh, system that we're talking about? What is, what is the way to um, attack it? Is, is there one kind of uh, silver bullet or hole we can plug that would really help, help address the problems we've been discussing? Uh, okay. Uh, th there's obviously no silver bullet that will kill the system. Um, we'll always have, there'll always be tax havens. I would say there are two main things that are required. One, one is on, on the technical level, I think we need to think about rather than going after, well, we need to go after all of them, but if we're going to focus our attentions, go after the banks and the financial sector, the private intermedi intermediaries, um, because that's where it's all happening. That's, um, that's generally the successful way to, to go after these things. The other thing is, uh, you know, at the end of the day, this is all about politics, it's about political change. We had a global financial crisis that, crisis that could have been a gigantic opportunity for reform here. When it hit, the analysis wasn't out there. People were kind of laboring under this idea that this system was somehow benign or small or not that important and the crisis hit, and we couldn't harness, there was, there was no analysis, no real analysis. There was some stuff that, <coughs> excuse me, the Tax Justice Network was just starting to put together some kind of systemic analysis, but it was still in its infancy. So that opportunity was lost, and I think, you know, opportunities for reform, at the end of the day, crisis is kind of required to get real change. Um, I think we're now in a slow burn crisis that's, um, that is, going on. It's a different kind of crisis. It's not a sharp shock, but it's a rise of what some people call populism. I hate the term because populism kind of equates left and right, um, and it also suggests that what, what's popular is wrong. And I think the crisis and subsequent events showed us that it's the experts who got it wrong, and maybe the people had it right all, all along. Um, but I, I think that we do need... So this kind of slow burn crisis that's going on is building up momentum. And you spoke about the difficulties of telling these complex stories, people's eyes glaze over. And it's something that's always worried me. You know, is this just a flash in the pan? I remember when I was writing Treasure Islands, there was some tax haven scandal that came out. I can't remember what it was actually. But um, my agent sort of called me and said, could you just quickly hurry your book out because um, you know, now's the time. You know, we won't get another moment like this. And I sort of, um, I just can't. You know, and I, sort of waited and then Treasure Islands came out and got a lot of attention um, and it was the global financial crisis I think which really lit the fire for people being willing to listen to this stuff the old system is discredited and here's you know a, a different kind of analysis so I think right now you know Trump administration's in power not much prospect for reform of the United States, a multipolar world emerging with China um, and other countries becoming more, relatively more powerful that don't have necessarily interests of our democracies uh, close, to, close, to, close to their hearts. So it's a difficult situation, but I think, you know, there are people who are saying there's, there could be another gigantic, sharp, sharp crisis around the corner. If you look at the financial system, all sorts of risks are building up. So we should be ready for something sharp to come along, something disruptive and unexpected to come along and really use that as an opportunity to, because um, that's when you can really push, push for change. Um, so, yeah. A lot of the, as you said, a lot of the points that I mentioned at, at the top, FATCA, uh, the Obama administration's attention to this, that was pushed by the global financial crisis, right? And, and it, it pushed them to, to do something. It, it was on the agenda, but uh, they, they clearly didn't go for, you know, far enough or, or to the top of the system. Uh, Mayor, would you uh, have, have some ideas on, on uh, how to kill the beast? <laughs> no, uh, no, I think, as we were saying, no, like a lot of this is driving uh, because of secrecy. So I think transparency is always uh, the best solution. So that's why we have been insisting and repeatedly saying that we need more transparency and we need to know who are the people behind this. And it should be much more difficult for those wanting to hide. And I think it should, it should be the exception, right? Like, why do you need an offshore company in the middle of this, uh, such a simple transaction, like a two-way transaction, why do you need to put five offshore companies in the middle? So I think it should be, people should start to have, I don't know, to, to prove that there is a reason 
for for that that offshore company to exist, and uh, more transparency, uh, I th for me, is the the only solution. Uh, another question I'd have, you know, I, I always think back to the Swiss banker who told me, you know, the, the world has changed, and and then I realized it it didn't. Um, I, I had that feeling again that maybe you know maybe the world of at least of tax havens has changed when uh, these big leaks come out, you know, Panama Papers and so on. Um, what's been your experience, you know? It's three years now, or three years out from from Panama Papers. Uh, that has been the impact of that. Um, you know, what's changed in terms of public perception and in terms of uh, policy uh, that you've seen, if anything. Well, I can start. I think there is significant change, at least at the EU level. I think the the anti money laundering directives, and we had actually an, a directive short time of period after one w was adopted. We had already had another one that goes way further in on uh, talking about transparency. So I think there are post policy, positive policy changes that were certainly driven by Panama Papers and other scandals that came, came true. Um, I, I think so, quite a lot has changed. I mean, on a, on a personal level, when Treasure Islands came out, there were a lot of people saying, oh, he's exaggerating. It's not really as bad as this. And then Panama Papers came out and like, okay, yeah, it is kind of like that. Um, I think what's been happening is that the offshore system, and again, I'm being very broad here, talking about the secrecy stuff and all, all the stuff that you've been talking about, but also this broader system um, involving corporate tax avoidance and you know financial regulation and so on. It develops, it progresses, it grows as a result of this, these kind of competitive dynamics. One jurisdiction puts in place a very clever new secrecy law money flocks there, other jurisdictions advised by their accountants and, and lawyers and bankers, hey, that jurisdiction's got this secrecy law, why don't you go one better and do something even more secret and even more devious here? So they put that in place. And you get this kind of race to the bottom. And this is a kind of generic dynamic that is expanding the system, pushing it forwards, and also pushing it into our supposedly onshore economies. Because our own, you know, the UK, I'm British, we're always saying we must be competitive in this area, must be, the city of London must be competitive. So we must degrade our re regulations a little bit more because Hong Kong's gonna race ahead of us. Um, so this kind of, so not only is the system expanding, it's, you know, onshore is becoming more offshore, we're all becoming more tax haven-like. So you have all this force pushing in one direction, before the global financial crisis, there was nothing really pushing in the other direction. This system was just growing under its own steam, under this kind of free market ideology of let it all happen, let the financial sector rip, and it'll generate prosperity and stuff. Now, after the global financial crisis, that complacency, that ideology has been shattered, and ordinary people in Britain, not so much in Germany, but in Britain, you get people, you know, I hear people talking in pubs about tax dodging and, and tax havens and stuff like that. It's, it's a popular subject now. Um, it depends on the country. But this kind of pressure is now rising from the streets in the other direction. Voters are noticing it, and governments, therefore, are noticing it. So they're pushing in the other direction. What's the result of these two opposing forces? Well, the result at the moment is a mess. So you have the OECD, a club of rich countries, is putting together some initiatives. The common reporting standard is, in many ways, a very impressive improvement on how things were before. Um, it is trying to create transparency, trying to get information shared around the world. It's also full of loopholes and lots of people lobbying to water it down and countries aren't implementing it properly and all sorts of stuff. So there's this kind of complexity and mess emerging. Um, on the corporate tax avoidance, there's another thing called BEPS, Base Erosion, Erosion and Profit Shifting, which is kind of the corporate multinational corporation version of this same thing. Um, but in that case, we're getting to a stage now where the international tax system for multinationals is kind of beginning to fall apart. There's a recognition, explicit recognition by the IMF just in the last few weeks, um, and also recognition by the OECD and by others that this system ain't working and we need a fundamental reform. But that's not what we're here to talk about. But, but the general phenomenon is you have these two opposing forces and it all depend on political will and voters, and we'll see where it goes. But there have been some improvements, and, and you know, things could have been an awful lot worse. Well, I mean, one, just a quick comment, and then we'll, we'll turn it over to questions. You know, as those two opposing forces kind of meet each other head on, you know, the, the, the pressure to change the system and, and the growing complexity of it, what I've seen is, is an even greater stratification of, of the, the very richest levels 
who can afford the complexity. The complexity costs money. It costs money to shift to new jurisdictions. It costs money to build these, these uh, uh, architectures of, of shell companies and so on. So the, the very richest still do fine. They're still protected by their ability to hire these armies of lawyers, right? And, and the, the pressure to change kind of nips away at, at the lower level uh, tax avoiders um, uh, you know, who are still in many cases breaking the law and, and do deserve to be punished, but still is, isn't, isn't causing systematic change. Um, so that's just something I, I've, I've observed while reporting on this. Um, and, and with that, um, I, I really want to hear what uh, issues you guys are interested in and, and what questions you have. We have two microphones um, that should be circulating around. So, uh, uh, yeah, please, right, right there in the middle. Um, two short questions for Nicholas. Um, what is your take um, on Brexit from a tax seven perspective? Like, do you think that the, the EU tightening um, anti-money laundering regulation had played any role in, I don't know, deciding to get get out of the EU? And second short question: You didn't have um, Austria and Germany in the European tax havens. Why that? <laughs> okay, I'll answer the second one first because it's much easier. Um, uh, Yes, I, I should have actually put Germany in there. Um, I don't know why I didn't. Germany definitely should be in there. Um, there is, uh, there's a book called Steuer oase Deutschland by Marcus Mainzer, which looks at this, um, how Germany, and if you look at the financial secrecy index of the tax justice network, Germany is, I think, number seven, if I'm right, something like that, very high up. One of those unrecognized tax havens. In other words, Money is coming from other countries into Germany, going into German real estate and all sorts of other assets, and Germany is not sharing that information with the governments of the people who, the, the rich people who are putting their money in Germany. So yes, I should have, and thank you for correcting me on that. And Austria as well. Austria for me is, a, indeed it is, it has been a tax haven. It's, it's one of the smaller ones. I, I find Luxembourg annoys me a lot more. That's why it was in there. Um, but you're quite right. I, mean, I could have included Monaco, Liechtenstein, um, you know, some Andorra, some of these. I mean, Austria is bigger than bigger than that. Um, now, Brexit. That's I hate that question um, because it's so complicated. There is basically in the Conservative Party in the UK there are kind of two factions. There's a pro-European faction and there's a uh, an anti-European faction. And the anti-European faction has got a lot of, a lot of the individuals involved had got a lot of question marks over their own finances. Um, and they have got all sorts of financial investments. It's not something I have followed in detail, so I can't give you any details about that. But there is a, a lot of um, what I would call offshore money in the Brexit movement. And in UKIP, the party that was um, very instrumental in bringing this issue up, so yes, offshore finance, and this would be an example of the damage that I was talking about, these inflows coming in, this connection with the offshore system. You know, the Conservative Party treasurer was um, big names in Belize, which is a very, Michael Ashcroft, very big um, tax haven. Um, all these characters across large parts of the Conservative Party, but also parts of at least the historic Labour Party before Jeremy Corbyn, quite a lot of off offshore interest there. It is the British establishment establishment. So there has been quite an offshore involvement in Brexit. Um, how that has worked, I have not followed in detail. Um, the other thing is, there is a, a faction that talks about what they call Singapore on the Thames. And what that model is, it's basically, if we go for Brexit, we can then be like Singapore. We can then be an offshore tax haven. We'll be free to do what we want. We can degrade our laws. We can be more secretive. We can, the, the EU won't stop us anymore from doing all this stuff. And um, we'll be rich. And that's, it's kind of uh, one of those things they say and a number of people believe it. And it's a persuasive argument for a significant section of the British population. Um, so yeah, that's a kind of rambling answer, but it's a very difficult question, but, but offshore certainly has got something to do with Brexit. Also, the Brexit vote was 52 to 48. You could say a lot of issues swung the vote because it was so close. Tax havens certainly swung the vote, um, not only for these reasons, but also because there is now a widespread understanding in Britain of how the elites are getting away with not paying taxes, with, 
with the laws falling away and everybody else having to do what they want. And they understand, it's very widely understood in Britain now, how important tax havens are in corrupting the entire British establishment. And this anger, which is also related to inequality and poverty and deprivation and all these terrible things that are happening in Britain, this anger um, was a massive contributor to the, to the, to the Leave campaign. So, um, for sure, you know, if, the, if the, that anger hadn't been there because of the offshore system, then, you know, in another world, it wouldn't have, you know, it would have swung the other way. So, yeah, and sorry, that's a bit of a so vague answer. To help you avoid self-promotion, just a, a point about your book. I mean, th that argument that uh, uh, the money's flowing in, if we become a tax haven, the money's going to flow in and we're all going to get rich, that has a, a very powerful effect on voters. It, it's, it's easy for politicians to say, if we pass these laws, these secrecy laws, the money's going to flow in, the banks are going to grow, and we're all going to get rich. Your book, you know, I think in a, in a groundbreaking way, points out that, that no, the, the systems that develop and the way the economy changes when this type of money, this type of finance flows in, is very problematic and in many ways damaging to, to the economy itself. Uh, Mayor, do you want to add something, or, or next question? Yeah, please. Yes, the gentleman there in the middle. If I may broaden it just a little bit to the political question that Nicholas brought up a couple of times. We've seen over years the reaction against the lobbying of the bankers, the derivatives dealers, swap dealers, huge sums of money that go in to stop any kind of change. And I think that's one of the things that's led to what some people deride as populism, but uh, the people across Europe and the United States are angry at the fact that people who have money are able to change the laws and to, be, to use that to evade taxes, to launder money. Just one quick example in the US, two people who were involved in covering up uh, money laundering were James Comey, who was on the board of Hong Kong Shanghai Bank and then became FBI director, Mr. Straight Arrow, and Robert Mueller, who is FBI director, covered up the BCCI scandal. So I, I'd just like you to address a little bit how you take on this, the, the flows of money that end up corrupting the politics. Yeah, that, that's a very fair point. There's another interesting angle to the, the BCCI scandal is, is something that it kind of exploded in the 1990s. This was a very British scandal, um, which involved what, for my money, is probably the, the rottenest bank in world history. Maybe not, maybe there's even worse banks than BCCI. Um, but another little interesting snippet of that is that there was a plan hatched by Margaret Thatcher's advisors um, in the early 1990s to make her president of BCCI when she stepped down. Um, I only found out that recently. Um, so, yeah, this bank, this rotten bank, kind of totally infected the British establishment and the US establishment as well. But in this case, it was generally um, uh, the US prosecutors that went after this British bank. And that's a long-standing pattern. There, are, there, is no pro there is almost no prosecution of British bankers by the British authorities in the last few decades. If you see British banks being prosecuted, it's by the US authorities. Even though US prosecutions of the banking sector has been thoroughly degraded during the Obama administration and before and since. Um, but Britain really is um, a, a, a particularly rotten player in this, in this game. Mary, you mentioned an example of uh, essentially politicians moving between political posts and, and bank posts as bank executives. I mean, uh, can, you, can you address I think that there problem? was a, I think there are a couple of examples in the US but elsewhere that shows like the problem of, of lobbying in enforcement. So there was recently this VAT bank case that is this Sweden uh, bank that is involved uh, in a huge money laundering scheme. Uh, there is also clear connections between people in the board of this bank and the supervisory authorities in Sweden uh, that shows like how close to power uh, these banks are. And in the case I presented, actually, like the, the BSI and, and Julius Baer, they were never punished. There, there's all this information. The, the David, this, this manager from BSI, is actually was arrested in Brazil. He's in jail in Brazil. And still, the FINMA in Switzerland, the supervisory authority responsible for financial institutions, didn't give 
any sort of punishment to any of these banks. So I think there is the, the industry is really powerful. In the US, there are other examples that goes beyond banks. So hedge funds and private equities in the US, they don't have any money laundering obligation. So basically they can get all the investment they want from whoever they want. They don't have any obligation to know who are the people behind the money that, that they are getting. And that's perfectly fine. Uh, real estate agents in the US. Since 2001, I think it's 2001 if I'm not mistaken, there is an exception to the, the Patriot uh, Rules in the U Patriot Act in the, in the US that says real estate agents are exempt from these rules for a while. This has been 20 years and they're still exempt from these rules. So I think it shows how par powerful lobbying of certain uh, 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 corporations and uh, professionals are and the impact it has uh, on policy and on enforcement. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, one policy idea to, to address some of the points you raised could be um, some kind of moratorium, right, uh, so, so that there can't be a revolving door directly from a senior political post like, I don't know, FBI director directly to the, to the executive suite of, of, a, of a major bank that was previously, you know, uh, that might be a pipe dream, but that, that is a policy decision that, that uh, governments could make, uh, so, you know, that there would be at least a three year legal period or some, something like that where uh, politicians or, or uh, regulators couldn't go work for a bank. But that, that could also just be a, a band-aid that wouldn't really address the problem. So it's, it's a tough one. Um, any other questions? Uh, in the back was the first first hand that went up there, the gentleman sitting by the camera. Hi, thanks for your takes on these topics. I wanted to know, it's very admirable the work you do and the, the work your collaborators do, you're not doing this alone. I'm, I'm just curious to know what are the, the personal costs attached to the work you're doing, because obviously you're stepping on certain people's toes. Maybe my wife would be best to address that, how, how little I, <laughs> she's sitting in the audience there. But yes, uh, loss of sleep, maybe uh, headaches from trying to explain what tax havens are. <laughs> um, yeah, but, but please. Uh, from my perspective, I, because I spend more time interested in the kind of systemic as aspects, I mean, I do, you know, investigate certain things, but my, invest my analyses generally use these to illustrate things, but are not the primary purpose of what I'm doing. So I generally haven't had problems with that. I've had bits and pieces of slightly menacing stuff happening, you know, in Ang Angola and places like that, but nothing, nothing too bad. I think it's people like, you know, OCCRP, Offshore Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, who really go, go and investigate, you know, gangsters and stuff like that. Those are the people who are really at the sharp end. Um, and, you know, some journalists who are investigating a particular story. But, um, yeah, so from, from my perspective, it hasn't been... You know, I, I was worried about it when Treasure Islands came out because I knew I was taking on a whole system. And I was also expecting, you know, because I, I was always wondering why, ha why has nobody reported on this before? It's not like the information is locked away. You know, I c you can find it, it's hard to find, but you can find it and you can put it together. Why has nobody put this anal analysis together? And I was kind of wondering maybe, you know, I've misunderstood something or got it all wrong or something. Um, and I was expecting when it was published to be a whole chorus of like, you're an idiot and this is just insane and possibly something more menacing than that. But when it came out, I was confronted with silence and that has generally been the response to what I published. Um, not attacking me back, there was one guy in the Cayman Islands, um, chairman of the Cayman Islands Monetary Authority called Anthony Travers who jumped up and down saying, Shaxon is an imbecile, doesn't know what he's talking about. Never with any specifics, always just he's an imbecile. Um, but apart from him, there really, wasn't, there really wasn't much. And I think, you know, in many cases, these people just kind of shrink away and, and you know, either they know they're doing something wrong or they don't want to listen to, you know, who they re people who they regard as, you know, leftists or whatever, and they just dismiss it and they've got the money and the power and they can sit in their little bubbles and, and talk, to them, talk among themselves and carry on their happy life drinking champagne. Um, but... As I said, there are other people who are much at a much sharper, sharper investigative place than I am. Yeah, I guess similar for me. I think uh, what we face sometimes is more the legal aspect of it, the harassment, right? So we are often harassed by governments or companies that don't like what we're saying, but f physical threats, uh, it's not something we face with the, the type of work we do. But I think tomorrow you're going to listen more from people who actually have first-hand experience with 
dealing more uh, with investigations and and the risks that that uh, incur also. I should can I just add yes the the point about libel is very important um that is for for people like me libel is <coughs> a huge headache um you can get sued in london and for really quite trivial things and you have to nail things down very very carefully and you can get into terrible trouble if you know get tied up and lose lots of money personally so that's for me has been the biggest threat uh, yeah one point from from the journalistic side i mean you brought up you brought up this point about uh, the boring term of uh, beneficial ownership transparency. I mean, what that means is, is, is exposing the money of someone who doesn't want it to be exposed. Uh, and when journalists do this, uh, from my experience working in, in Russia and Ukraine, that is the most dangerous type of work. It's not, and people often ask me like, oh, how do you write these things about Putin? You know, uh, aren't you scared? You know, criticizing politicians, even in places like Russia, generally is okay. Exposing how someone makes money in a way that they don't want exposed is extremely dangerous. And you know, this, this happened to me. There, there was once a story I worked on. It's like 2010, maybe, um, where it was an arms dealer who was shipping arms. It's an amazing story from North Korea to Iran, like the most sanctions isolated, locked up countries. He was shipping, uh, and he was a, a Russian gentleman from Kazakhstan. And because of my article, he wound up in a UN uh, list of. Uh, uh, san san sanctioned or designated individuals. Uh, and yeah, he sent, sent guys around to the office uh, to try to, I guess, beat me up. Luckily, I, I you know, wasn't around at the time and I had to leave the country. So these things happen. Like when you uh, hone in on, on that beneficial owner behind these networks of, of companies, um, that's the most uh, dangerous work that journalists can do. And, and, and I think, uh, you know, I, I commend the, the folks at OCCRP, especially who we're going to hear from a bit later for, for doing that kind of work. Um, do we have time for one more question? And, and the whistleblowers, isn't it? Let's uh, not forget the yes, whistleblowers. Yes, whistle, the whistleblowers, especially, yeah, when, when they come forward. Yeah. Time for one more question, please? All right. Yes, yes. Waiting patiently. Thank you. No, it actually touches my question on what you just said. It seems to me that the uh, dark havens, the tax shelters, all of this is just the tip of the iceberg and the way to put money into an incredibly large shadow banking system that's financing huge amounts of operations and illegal drug running, uh, weapons running, weapons systems, and transnational operations, military operations that are in the interests of various parties, and going all the way to the Vatican, which is financing things all over. So really, just the dark havens are just the way to shelter, to put money into that system. But the system itself shadows the, the dark havens, the, the, the sheltering by far. I mean, that's just a tip of the iceberg, really, of the shadow banking system, what you're talking about. I think the broader system couldn't work without it, right? I mean, w would you agree, Nick? Yeah, yeah. Yes, I mean, it depends what you mean by the shadow bank banking system. I mean, there's, um, uh, there's certain sort of players that are recognized as, you know, in, in financial regulatory circles anyway, as shadow banking players, hedge funds, um, and so on. Is that what you're talking about? Okay, I mean, once the money is in the system, Okay, and there's trillions. There's even estimates that it's bigger than our transparent system. It's financing huge operations, uh, huge purchases of weapons, huge purchases of drugs, the whole movement all the way back from the 50s, you know, in Cuba and all of this was huge amounts of money. Martin, Patricia Goldstein, Goldstone speaks about it in Interlock. Mark Lombardi did, an artist did diagrams of it. I mean, it's talked about uh, really in circles. Of course, you gave an example. Um, when you really go into it, your life becomes threatened. When you go into a specific deal that's financed by this shadow banking operation, then your life becomes threatened. And uh, because as long as it's not talked about and it's not out there, and the dark havens are a, a, a lot of the people who are sheltering money are not a part of this system. They're just like executives that want to illegally 
put uh, shelter money and not pay taxes and whatever. But, uh, but this whole system of the dark havens is just the tip of the iceberg of something that has trillions behind it and that's used uh, also transnational political uh, things like CIA has alternative operations that are illegal that are all funded through this system. Well, I would kind of disagree with your characterization of that, actually. I, I think that there is this misunderstanding that the tax havens, the offshore system of tax havens, is some sort of exotic sh sideshow to something much bigger. No, I would argue that tax havens are right at the heart of the global economy and the financial globalization that's been going on, particularly since the 1970s. Um, so this system is absolutely central to, to, to what's going on, I think. Um, and yeah, and, and, but you're right that all sorts of uh, operations that we see are rooted through. Every multinational in the world has lots of subsidiaries in tax havens. Um, so, it, but it is absolutely central to, to everything that's happening in, in the financial system, the global financial system. Is there anything? Yeah. No, just maybe to say I agree with you and I think the only similarity is that perhaps the same mechanisms are used by different groups, so armed trafficking, drug trafficking, human trafficking, they all use the same mechanisms that are in the offshore center, so I think that's, that's it, yeah. yeah and, and just to add, you know, kind of obvious point that it would be a lot more difficult for the, the more violent networks, drug traffickers, um, human traffickers, uh, weapons deals, it would be a lot more difficult for them to operate as freely as they do today if, if they didn't have the ability to use uh, the offshore banking system to hide their profits, to move money around, to make payments and so on. So I think that's, that's a really important thing that, that as a journalist I try to get across whenever, and I'm sure you do too, Nick, you, you do as well, that um, you know, we're not just talking about uh, bus businessmen and corporations hiding, hiding their money, um, we are talking about the, the more kind of you know, violent and dangerous phenomena in, in our societies uh, are f fueled by uh, tax havens and, and probably, I mean, I think couldn't really function, at least not in the same way as easily uh, w without them. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, any, any criminal organization, say it's in the United States, for example, if it was not able to use offshore tax havens, if it was having to do everything through US domestic bank accounts, if they were bottled up at home, the force of law and order would have an awful lot easier job going after them. Right, I, th I think we have to end it there. I, I just end by, by plugging a report that Mayra has coming out. You were innocently didn't mention it. Maybe September, but look out for it. It's coming from Transparency International. It's in the works. Thank you all very much. You've been a great audience. Uh, and and I'll, I'll hand it over to Tatiana. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think it's been really a great start of our conference. Thanks to all of you. I just want to say that now we have a 15 uh, minutes break and then to come back, we will have the panel leaking massive data sets. So we also enter into the deep of the data there. And uh, after this panel, we will have the screening of the film, uh, the Panama Papers. So please come back in 15 minutes. Thank you. And thank you.